so, uh, so yeah. can I start, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. This briefing. Yeah. Uh, good yeah. evening, everyone. Welcome to the season three, the thirty-eighth webinar of CIOMS. This is the CIOMS webinar team where we have Dr. Ramakrishna Shinoy. He is the president of the academy. Dr. Varsha Manika. She is a, a secretary of our academy. Dr. Brinda Kote. She is the treasurer of our academy. Dr. Madhumati Dhawa, she is a scientific coordinator and myself, I am the webinar coordinator. Today we have a wonderful session on regional flaps and maxillofacial reconstruction by Dr. Reena John, which will be moderated by Dr. Shubhra Shohan. Upcoming, we have a very important topic that is plates and screws. This is very important for postgraduate students from point of view of your practical exams as well as theory also. It will be on 14th. 11 a.m. and this will be live telecasted on Facebook. This will be by Dr. Ramakrishna Shinoy. Then on 18th, 11 a.m. we have a guided surgery in orbitofacial trauma by Dr. Anant Narayan. This is regarding the uh, social media page of Central India Association of Full and uh, Central India Academy of Full and Maxillofacial Surgeons. This is the QR code for the YouTube channel. You can scan it. You can subscribe it and please don't forget to hit the bell icon so that whatever videos are being uploaded, you'll get a notification about that. And also please like and follow us on Facebook. That's all from my side. Thank you, Abhilasha. Uh, I would like to introduce our webinar team for the 38th webinar. Uh, Dr. Varsha, can you say hello to people? Varsha is the secretary. And efficiency is our byline. Uh, hi, Varsha. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I welcome our speaker. I welcome our speaker, Dr. Reena, and uh, moderator, Dr. Shubra. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Varsha. Uh, Brinda is the treasurer and she is the host of the meeting today. Uh, Brinda, we have uh, very dynamic ladies, uh, Dr. Reena and Shubra. Uh, they're very well-known uh, people in this field. And uh, it's, it's, it's an honor for us that we have uh, Dr. Reena, uh, who's the president of the Tamil Nadu chapter, uh, to be with us. Thank you for accepting our invitation, ma'am. Uh, Brinda? Uh, please go ahead. Rinda, you're muted. Very yeah, good evening Rinda. to one and all. No, no, <laughs> everything all right. And and uh, uh, <laughs> Varsha, I forgot to introduce Abhilasha, but then Abhilasha is the no introduction. So yeah, she needs, she needs no introduction. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I, I am getting old as you know as the days pass. I mean that's it's undeniable. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> yeah. So Brinda, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So go, very good evening to everyone. I welcome you all once again on this CIMS AOMS platform on 38th webinar of this webinar series. And we have very eminent Dr. Reena John, madam. And it will be ably moderated by Dr. Shubhra Chauhan, madam. Both the ladies are doing wonders in the field of oncosurgery. And I know they are going to rock this podium once again with their knowledge. And we are going to have a feast of knowledge for us. Dr. Shubhra Chauhan has completed her MDS from GDC Chennai with gold medal. And she has keen interest in oncology. So she developed herself uh, in this field. She pursued four fellowships in the field of oncosurgery in various prestigious institutes like Malabar Center, Kerala, uh, Muzumdar Shah at Bangalore, then uh, Ninth People at Shanghai, and MSKCC at USA. She has an array of publication and presentations at various national and international forums. She also works for a social cause and works with her Rajan Cancer Hospital, which is a non-profit organization working for a cancer patients. At present, she is working as a consultant in head neck, uh, consultant in head neck oncosurgery at VS Hospital Chennai. So we have very eminent uh, speaker and ably it will be moderated by Dr. Shubra. 
So I invite Dr. Shubhra to carry out further proceedings. Dr. Shubhra, over to you. Thank you so much for those words. It's like little overboard actually. So I told her to shorten it up. But more important is our uh, uh, speaker for the evening. That's Dr. Veena. Uh, she's of course um, all of us all think everybody almost knows that she's the head of the department and she's the vice uh, principal of uh, Vinay Commission at Salem and she's been there since. quite some time i think we must be studying and ma'am has been there already besides the uh, this of course she is now taken over the tamil nadu pondicherry chapter of our association but besides all this uh, position it's primarily as a person at a personal level i'll really like to tell she is really a dynamic lady the softer she looks from outside the more dynamic she is from inside and i really got to know her just few years back i had met her in uh, uh, one of these uh, uh conferences that's like one of our state conferences and when i got to know ma'am and then i realized the whole dynamics behind her and how she is working out holding the department bringing it up and and a lot of vision from what she is doing now and she has for further with her department as well as for the college so things which are to learn from her and of course today we'll be learning about the flaps from her so over <laughs> to you ma'am for the talk i'll be moderating the questions in between so you can all keep putting the questions in the chat box as well as for the youtube visitors uh, you can keep putting it in the box and they'll get forwarded and we'll uh, ask the questions to ma'am over zoom so please keep putting on the questions over to you ma'am thank you thank you dr shubhra dr shinoy can we start or uh... yeah 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 it's enabled okay so i'll share my screen uh -oh. so if just a minute from all others can please mute for the presentation time so that there won't be disturbance from other mics thank you yeah so uh before i start i want to thank dr shubhra for such a beautiful introduction uh it's uh, actually an honor to be moderated by dr shubhra because she is a fellow of one of the most fantastic onco surgeons i would say that i know or in the world i would say because Dr. Moni Kuriakos is uh, uh, somebody I admire and adore, and I'm so I'm so honored that uh, a fellow of his is moderating my session. And uh, more and uh, more importantly, I would want to thank Dr. Ramakrishna Shinoy and Dr. Abilasha for having invited me and given me this opportunity to do on this platform of CIA OMS. and the whole team i met dr vrinda yesterday and it was fantastic that that energy that you have this team that's that is why we we've reached the 38th session and it's going forward many more to come so i thank the whole team for this opportunity and uh, so today's uh, webinar is on regional flaps and maxillofacial reconstruction a skill revisited i hope all of you can hear me dr abilasha can you hear me Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Can... Okay. Right. Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shubha. So uh, you know, uh, so regional flaps in the maxillofacial reconstruction. Uh, we must be wondering because we've come to a stage where uh, microvascular is like the in thing, the fad, right? So wondering why we're talking about regional flaps. All right. Uh, and this is the most appropriate time, you know, uh, to talk about regional flaps. Being in the COVID pandemic, and uh, we are not sure whether we should be taking long duration surgeries. And uh, what is it that we do when we have a case like this? What you see on the screen is a is a middle aged man with a huge swelling on the left side of the face. Uh, he has been operated five years back for an amyloblastoma of the left mandible. and if you see the opg you will see the uh, can you see my cursor so you you will see that there is no mandible at all right there is a reconstruction plate apparently he's had a left hemi mandibulectomy and a fibula uh, microvascular a fibula free flap that was done all right so you can make out sorry you can make out all those uh, you know staples there and uh, this is what i see and if you see the mri you can see that on the left side there is a cystic lesion of whatever is remaining of the mandible so what can we do we need to resect and whenever we think of resection we need to before we get into the surgery we need to think of how to reconstruct 
And uh, it is very easy for us to theoretically say, wow, we can do a fibula again. Now, will the patient be happy with doing a fibula again when he has already had a failed fibula? No, it's not a failed fibula, but a recurrence after five years. That is another, that is one of the questions. The second question is, see, being in the COVID time and the anesthetist and the hospital not very happy with long duration surgeries may uh, make you want to think of another option, which would be, can we uh, think of uh, uh, reconstruction with regional flaps? So that is why I think this topic of regional flaps seems to be more appropriate at this time. The, the challenges that you would face here is to restore function, aesthetics, and of course, restoring the defect back, you know, uh, with something appropriate, right? So what is it now, now that you know that when you come across such, uh, such a situation, you need to resect and think of reconstruction. So what is it that you want to reconstruct? If you have a defect in the uh, maxilla, your, your reconstruction would be uh, defined by how much of the maxilla has been resected. And that is why Brown has come up with that classification. So before we go into the defect, I just want to get a few things clarified for you all. You know, we used to think about reconstruction and the reconstructive ladder, but actually the reconstructive ladder has become something of the past, not spoken about now because, uh, you know, there is such a huge uh, uh, you know, um, understanding on what is a wound, what is a defect, and what is a deformity. So a wound is actually a disruption of parts. So you know, a wound is like uh, what what has been what has been classified by the American uh, Surgeons Association, you know, into uh, a lacerated wound or infected wound or clean contaminate. Th those are wounds. There's just a disruption of part, and that you can debride and uh, suture. So that is it. But a defect is what? A defect is when there is a loss of parts. And that is what we are talking about here, a loss of parts. And therefore, reconstruction will not usually follow that reconstructive ladder that we've always spoken about. It's become uh, more of a folklore than uh, something that we need to even uh, talk about in academics. You know, uh, So reconstruction of a defect would mean a defect is a loss of part, not like a wound. Defect is a loss of a part and needs reconstruction with some sort of a tissue, a flap, a, a, a graft, right? Uh, so uh, uh, so when, when Brown classified uh, the maxillary defect in 2000, he classified it. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with Brown, Brown's classification, classified the maxillary defect in a vertical and a horizontal component, where a vertical component class one was when you have uh, a maxillary alveolus uh, defect without involving the antrum, without an oroantral fistula. When you have a horizontal component, when the central palate is uh, 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 on one side of the palate, sorry, on one side of the maxilla, up to the midline, it is type A, crossing the midline type B, and the whole of the maxilla type C. Type 2 is when it is involving one or two walls of the maxilla, and type 3 is when it's involving the floor of the orbit, and type 4 is when it involves the medial wall of the orbit and may be associated with orbital exoneration. Now, why do we have this classification? This classification will help us to determine what kind of a reconstruction you want to do. The same thing goes with the uh, uh, HCL classification that was put up in 1993 by Boyd and his colleagues as HCL, H is hemimandibular, the defect that we saw earlier, hemimandibular, that, was, that is the lateral part of the mandible, including the condyle. The central C is the central defect, uh, while the L is the lateral defect, excluding the condyle. So the, what you see on the right side of, your, uh, of the picture, you see the H, the C, and the L. Right. So why do we again have such classifications? There is a certain, um, you know, rationale in having these classifications. Basically, if you, if you know that it's a lateral defect, you know that you can reconstruct it with a straight segment of bone. But if you have a central defect, you would want to osteotomize the, the bone and then, uh, you know, contour it so that you get that U shape of the mandible. And in addition to that, you could have you could have many combinations of these defects and it could be combined with soft tissue defects which would be the tongue the mucosal or the external skin defect 
So uh, it is important for you to know the Browns classification and the HCL um, uh, Boyd's classification, which I'm sure most of you know. And why do you have these classifications? It helps you to determine what kind of a reconstruction you, you want to do. And the general principles of reconstruction is that you would want to replace like with like. That's a very idealistic Thing that you would want to do. But now this lecture of mine is reconstruction with, re, uh, with regional flaps, which means that I'm not thinking about replacing like with like. Now, if I have a mandibular defect uh, of the lateral L, lateral mandible, what would I want to do? I would want to reconstruct it with the bone. If the mucosa is lost and mucosa and skin and muscle, then skin and muscle. So the ideal, you know, reconstructing option may have been a fibula, but now I'm talking about regional flap. So General principles are you replace like with like, and you, if you are talking about the face, you have the facial units, the aesthetic units, look at the aesthetic units and think of the, uh, the type of flaps you want to uh, put up. You always need to have a backup uh, plan and you never forget the donor area. That is very important. Why have, you, why have I put that, uh, you know, that uh, picture on the, uh, on the right um, for you? It is basically to make you, help you understand uh, uh, about flaps. You know, uh, when we talk about skin flaps, uh, at least when I was studying, I was told that skin flaps, not grafts, huh? skin flaps, if they are very wide uh, and if they, their width is equal or a little more than the length, then it has a better, um, a better chance of, uh, uh, you know, survival. Um, and uh, that is called a random uh, pattern flap when you have a uh, blood supply which it does not have a named blood supply it have it has blood supply from all over and that is run so what is what is understood in the evolution of development of flap is that if we understand the vascular supply to the skin where it is coming from and if we base the uh, the skin flap whether it is skin with fascia fascia cutaneous or it is skin fascia and muscle that is myocutaneous or if it is an osseo myocutaneous if you know the kind of blood vessel and the 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 the, the course of the blood vessel and you take the flap in the long axis of the course of the blood vessel then however large your skin uh, flap will be the, it it is viable and it is it can succeed and therefore you should be able to understand that uh, a flap does not have to have a wide base and a you know a base has to be one is to one with the with the length that was all olden uh, uh, older kind of an understanding once we've understood the angiosomes of the uh, of the uh, face we and we understand the vascular um, you know uh, anatomy of the face and how the uh, flap has to be designed then we will understand that the flap can be whichever way, whichever big, but if it is on the long axis of the vascular supply, which is called the axial pattern um, uh, flap, then your survival uh, of the flap is much uh, more likely. So this is a picture to understand the vascularity, vascular supply of the flap. If you look at the picture on the left side, you will see that uh, there is a uh, a vessel that goes through the fascia and to the skin. That's called a direct cutaneous flap. And if you have a, a vessel that is parallel between the muscle spindles, uh, you know, through the septae of the muscles, that is called a septocutaneous uh, blood supply. And if it is coming from the, you know, you, you have a muscle that is, uh, you have a vessel which is supplying a muscle and gives out a branch to the fascia and the uh, skin, then that is called the musculocutaneous. That is, that was the uh, classification of fasciocutaneous flaps by Mathis and Nahai. There are a lot of classifications that have been put up. You have, uh, you know, uh, skin flaps or, or that have been, uh, 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 as I said earlier, they are random pattern and actual pattern flaps. You have the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, fascio cutaneous flap that has been classified by Cormac and uh, uh, Lamberti, depending, depending on how many number of uh, perforators are there. So you understand what is a perforator. A perforator is a supply to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the flap. It may be through the septae between the muscles, which is called a septocutaneous, which may be direct, or it could be from the muscle to the, uh, to the skin, which is called a musculocutaneous perforator, or it may be from the main branch, you know, going through the muscle and then uh, supplying the skin, which is called a indirect 
um, uh, septocutaneous uh, uh, perforator. So you can have a direct perforator and an indirect perf perforator. So till now, I hope you understood the change in our understanding of flap. The, the fact that the reconstructive ladder does not really um, you know, hold ground right now because one is we've understood that wound is different from a defect. A wound is a disruption of part. That is where you will think of primary suturing and secondary grafting and things like that. We are talking about defects. Defect is a loss of a part. Uh, Dr. Abhilasha always will be talking about skin, I mean, cleft lip and palate, I think. That is a deformity where you will, you will rotate. You know, it's a distortion of parts where you'll rotate the uh, anatomic structures into position and uh, and uh, restore function so so you should understand that concept of yours should be should be cleared first wound defect and uh, deformity and uh, uh, therefore uh, you know therefore you should understand that uh, uh, defect is what we are talking about right now and to be reconstructed by flaps and uh, uh, you know, there are the different types of vascular supply to the flaps. I hope you've understood what is the meaning of a, a direct cutaneous supply, a septocutaneous supply and a musculocutaneous supply. What do we mean by a direct perforator and an indirect perforator, which is very important as we go further, you will understand uh, when we talk about the different supplies to different flaps, right? So, uh, so, you know, initially, uh, we used to talk about uh, flaps in terms of geometry, you know, a rhomboid flap, a triangular flap, an advancement flap, you know, a Limburg flap. These are all lo local flaps, which uh, are based on the aesthetic units I spoke about earlier. Uh, so if you have a defect on the face, you would, uh, you would which is not involved, which is not very deep, which is which is uh, of a dimension which can, uh, which is continuous with the flap that you are racing. That's called a local flap. As you see in the picture there, you have a defect in the malar region. You've taken a flap from the cheek and you've rotated in it there. That is a local flap. What are we talking about today? We're talking about talking about regional flaps, flaps from a dist a site different distant from the. Uh, uh, defect and which is brought into uh, into the uh, uh, defect by proper dissection along the course of the perforator vessels. So you can, you have regional flaps and you have perforator flaps. So uh, there is this is the anat uh, the atomic system that has been uh, um, described by Tolhurst. What he says is a flap can be a skin with fat a skin with fat and fascia, a skin with fat, fascia and muscle or a muscle alone flap or even with, with cartilage or bone. So you can have different types of flaps uh, which can go from skin to a composite flap. And depending on where you want to take it, it can be a local flap or a distant flap. And as I said earlier, depending on its blood supply, it can be axial or it can be random pattern. And uh, uh, whether you're rotating it into position, that all that comes usually with a local flap, rotating it into position, transposing it, interpolating it. These are all the different types of uh, 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 you know, uh, positioning of the local flaps into the defect. But here, when we're talking about uh, regional flaps, we're talking about pedicle flaps. Most of them are pedicle to a, 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 a vascular uh, channel, uh, you know, a dominant vascular pedicle. Most of them are, uh, are uh, pedicle to a dominant uh, vascular pedicle. Now, now that we have understood uh, uh, these concepts, now uh, the next thing that we need to know is now what are the factors that will, that will influence flap selection, okay? Especially in these pedicle flaps, no? What are the factors? So the local factors influencing at the recipient site is the site of the defect, the size of the defect, and the type of the defect, right? So if your site of the defect is in the lower phase, you, would, you could afford to take a um, a flap from the chest, you could afford to take a, fla a, a flap from the, um, you know, the latissimus dorsi region. If it is more posteriorly in the scalp region, you could even take from the back, that's a trapezius. If it is 
in the uh, more in the superior region you would want to take something like the temporalis then again you would want to know the size of the defect and therefore how much of flap you can raise from the donor site so those are the local factors that will influence at the recipient site now at the donor site what would you want to what would the local factors be the bulk of the flap how much bulk is needed now if you have a big, uh, you know a tongue defect which is which is huge and uh, you take a temporalis flap and you keep it there it may not take so you need bulk so when you need bulk you may have to take something that is more that has more muscle bulk in it not just a fascio cutaneous you would want to take a musculo cutaneous flap the pliability of the flap if you want to do if you want to restore a defect which needs to move around you need to take a a pliable flap the arc of rotation because you don't want tension you cannot you have to be able to rotate the flap without tension into the defect so the arc of rotation and the length of the pedicle these are the local factors that influence at the donor site now i told you earlier there are many uh, classifications as i said fascio cutaneous itself is classified by cormack and lamberti and mathes and nahai and uh, uh, by nakajima and uh, uh now we're talking about the muscle flaps the muscle flaps the the most common or most accepted or most understood muscle flap classification is by mathes and nahai's classification the mathes and nahai's classification why is it easy to understand is they have classified it as five types where the type 1 has one dominant vascular pedicle as it's seen in tensor fascia lata the uh, the type 2 is when you have one dominant pedicle and minor pedicles like like in uh, you know your gracilis muscle and uh, the type 3 is when you have two dominant pedicles like your gluteus maximus and type 4 is when you have multiple segmental pedicles like the sartorius and type 5 is when you have one major pedicle and maybe many segmental secondary uh, you know secondary segmental small small pedicles like your internal mammary uh, artery with the um, you know the thoraco acromion vessel as the major like in your uh, pectoralis major muscle or as as is put here the latissimus dorsi so that has one dominant pedicle and multiple secondary segmental pedicles so that's mathes nahai i'm sure all of you know these classifications you know if you all are post graduate sitting there you all know the defects of the maxilla is classified by brown uh, uh, in 2000 in 1993 uh, hcl by boyd and uh, you know uh, his colleagues the jewers classification uh, the mathes and nahai's classification of the muscle paddle understand that mathes nahai has also classified a uh, modification of cormack and lamberti which is which is a fascio cutaneous uh, flap so i think by now you've understood the difference between a skin flap a fascio cutaneous flap a myocutaneous flap a muscle paddle flap or muscle flap all right so now uh, i think i will start with each individual pedicle flaps that are used to reconstruct defects of the maxillofacial region right so uh, this is an article which gives you an updates in forehead flap reconstruction of facial defects if you go through this article uh, you will be able to uh, um, uh, you know read a lot of modifications that they have uh, in they have listed out of the forehead flap but here i am just going to talk about two uh, flaps which are uh, commonly uh, was commonly done um, can be done even now so the traditional forehead flap was described by blair and kazanjan and uh, what they have described and usually these forehead flaps you no know, which was which was traditionally described was a central forehead flap which was based by, on the supratrochlear and supraorbital vessels and uh, according to blair and kazanjan they 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 did a two stage um, uh um, procedure that is in the first stage the flap was elevated like a tongue shaped flap and usually these forehead flaps were used to reconstruct the nose which could have had a defect because of uh, tumor ablation or uh, uh due to uh, uh trauma right defects of the nose due to trauma so the first stage would be the flap elevation and transfer and the second stage would be the flap division and insert which is usually done in 3 to 4 weeks time the second modification was a single stage forehead flap which was described by converse and uh, wood um, also uh so here what they do is they tunnel it in they deepithelize the part that goes in and tunnel it in so that's what i was talking about reconstruction of nose with the help of central forehead flaps which is based on the supratrochlear and supraorbital vessels so that flap is rotated round 
and uh, to reconstruct the nose. The, the, the right side picture shows you the lateral uh, flap, which is uh, lateral forehead flap, which is based on the superficial temporal vessels. And uh, that is used to reconstruct the uh, lateral cheek defects. So this is a case uh, where we had a disease of the gingival buccal sulcus, which is called, called also called the Indian cancer, which uh, uh, had also uh, uh, disease in the skin. And therefore, we had a composite resection with the uh, neck dissection and a forehead flap because we couldn't, uh, at that time, this was done a few years back, uh, think of another uh, uh, reconstructive option. And therefore, we did a forehead flap. The patient was happy that she doesn't have disease. She could open her mouth. She could function. So uh, it doesn't look very good. It's, it's an ugly flap, but served the purpose nevertheless. The advantages of a forehead flap is its proximity to the oral cavity. And... Uh, uh, this tissue is very supple and it's it's firm and holds the sutures very well. It has excellent blood supply, you know, and uh, very, very, uh, very, very uh, thin. So it can be very uh, nice to uh, put it into the intraoral for intraoral defects. If you see the picture there, if you want to tunnel it in and bring it in intraoral, and if, it's, if the coronoid process is hindering, you can do a coronoidectomy to uh, bring it into the uh, intraoral uh, defect. The disadvantage, of course, as you can see, even my earlier picture and here, uh, the disadvantage is the noticeable donor defect. You have a horrible forehead, right? And uh, another thing is, as you see here in the first picture, you have that pedicle and then we de-pedicled it. Uh, and that was done as a second op second surgery after three to four weeks. And uh, uh, another intraoperative disadvantage is uh, sometimes you can have uh, uh, you know, you can have uh, troubling bleeding and uh, you can you can go back. You, you may have to go back in the night and then see where that bleeder is coming from. If you haven't achieved hemostasis uh, adequately during the surgery, bleeding is a problem that can call you back to the OT uh, if you haven't taken care of it there. So that's about the forehead flap. Very simple flap. Uh, very easy to raise. Uh, it is a fascia cutaneous flap. You don't take the uh, frontalis muscle along with that you, uh, you raise the flap from the you know uh, if you look at that uh, yeah sorry uh, so that incision is given parallel to the uh, uh, you know transverse incisions parallel to the forehead above the eyebrow you can take it right up to the opposite side depending on how much of um, uh, defect you want to you want to uh, cover and uh, that's a fascia cutaneous. You, you, you have a very nice, you can just peel it off after you've given that incision. The important thing is, uh, is uh, get, uh, getting, achieving hemostasis as you're raising the flap. That is the most important thing. Yeah. And uh, so, so next we come to the temporalis flap. So uh, temporalis flap described by Golovin in 1898. Uh, and we all know the temporalis muscle. It's very very uh, uh, familiar to us. Uh, it's a fan-shaped muscle uh, on the temporal region, on the lateral part of the skull. And you can take a, a fascia alone uh, flap, or you can take a fascia with a muscle, or take a muscle alone flap. The best approach for this would be, your axis could be the, the Alkyad Bramley or a hemicoronal approach would be nice to take the uh, uh, temporal muscle flap. So what is important here for you to understand is, uh, you know, you have, when you're incising, you have the skin, you have the subcutaneous tissue, you have the fat, and then you come to the temporoparietal, the white thing, you come to the temporoparietal fascia. The temporoparietal fascia is where you will have the uh, superficial temporal vessel. And just below that, you will have the uh, frontal branch of the facial nerve, just above the zygomatic arch or lateral to the zygomatic arch, the frontal branch of the facial nerve. That is the structure that you do not want to, um, do not want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, damage. So uh, the safest uh, plane of dissection for, uh, uh, to avoid damage to the frontal nerve. If you can actually see on the right side, I don't know if, can you see my cursor? I don't think you can see. Can you see my cursor? Yes, ma'am, we can see, ma'am. Okay, okay. ma oh, thank you. So that is the frontal branch of the facial nerve. Can you see that? Okay, so this is the temporoparietal fascia or the superficial temporal fascia, right? So you will have the superficial temporal vessels and the uh, frontal branch of the facial nerve in that plane. All right. Now, if you have 
incised through the deep temporal fascia and then you will come to the temporalis muscle this deep temporal fascia then divides you know around 1.5 to 2 cm above the frontal bra branch of the fa facial nerve it will divide into the uh, superficial and the deep temporal uh, uh, fascia or the superficial layer and the deep deep layer of the deep temporal fascia right so when you're giving an incision and you're taking a temporoparietal fascia temporoparietal fascia you have to be careful of the frontal branch of the facial nerve when you come lower so your your uh, you know arc of rotation with the temporoparietal fascia may not be as much as with the uh, temporalis muscle so you when you when you incise the deep temporal fascia you will see the red muscle and then you can incise and there you don't need to worry about the facial nerve at all because the facial nerve is somewhere here sorry yeah the facial nerve is here so i want you all to understand that so you you don't have to get scared of the facial nerve i may damage the facial nerve don't worry about that because when you're taking the temporalis muscle you're well away from the facial uh the frontal branch of the facial nerve so here you can see that you have the skin you have the subcutaneous fat you have the gallia aponeurotica you have this uh, you know the tempora temporoparietal fascia then the loose areolar tissue and then the deep temporal fascia then the temporalis muscle so that is the way you go incising to reach the temporalis muscle so uh, you uh, as we saw earlier the temporoparietal fascia is a is a structure which is supplied by the superficial temporal artery while the temporalis muscle is supplied by the anterior and deep temporal branch of the maxilla internal maxillary artery which comes from the medial surface medial surface of the muscle and uh, therefore they have very good supply and the the chances of losing uh, a tempora temporoparietal fascia or the temporalis muscle is very very less the only problem with this is the arc of rotation and the reach is not uh not too too much and the bulk of the mu muscle if it is if it is in an older individual is uh, much less so you may not get enough bulk to uh, uh to reconstruct a defect so that's a cadaver dissection where you see that temporoparietal fascia and the temporoparietal and the muscle along with that how it is taken out from you know it is dissected out it's a very uh, clean uh, surgery uh, you, you wouldn't have bleeding unless you have a bleeding in the temporoparietal area where you have uh, you know nick the uh, superficial temporal vessel so you could you could rotate the flap into the eye tunnel it bit in the you know below the skin and into the eye reconstruct the cheek and you can also reconstruct intraoral defect of the cheek or of the uh, palate so that is an uh, a case where uh, you know you you can see that bulk on that uh, you can you can see the bulk here yeah that's because of the tunneling below the skin of the temporalis muscle and obturating the uh, orbit and here you have the temporalis muscle um, used to uh, uh, obturate the uh, maxilla the maxillary defect okay so obviously after seeing this you know that the temporalis flap can be used to close oroantral oronasal fistula anything in the maxilla ablative defects of the maxilla interpositional for uh, temporomandibular joint ankylosis or uh, and uh, from the uh, discussion i'm or from the uh, from what i presented i'm sure you would have understood that uh, it's very easy to elevate very reliable blood vessel and it's an aesthetic scar because it's a coronal approach so the it goes within the hairline the disadvantages are the temporal hollowing and uh, maybe you would have uh, sensory disturbances but you if you've gone through the planes properly you wouldn't cause facial nerve uh, injury so what have we cover, covered till now we've covered the forehead flap and we've covered the temporalis flap i'm sure uh, all of you all of you can raise these flaps to um, uh, reconstruct uh, small defects of the maxilla and uh, uh, the uh, uh, cheek and the uh, uh, intraoral defects now we come to the nasolabial flap so nasolabial as we know as the uh, name suggests and as you see here is uh, uh in the region of the cheek uh between the angle of the eye medial canthus of the eye and the and the angle of the mouth or a little even below that up to the lower border of the mandible so what you see here is actually a, a nasolabial island flap 
So what is it that you raise in a nasolabial uh, flap? Okay, so what you see here is the skin, uh, epidermis, dermis. The yellow structure is the fat. And then you see the expression muscle, the orbicularis, uh, uh, oris muscle, and the uh, expression muscles like the rhizorius and the zygomaticus major, minor, the buccinator muscle. So these are the muscles that, so this is where, this is the nasolabial fold. You can see that, right? This is a nasolabial fold. Now look at where the facial nerve is. The facial nerve is so much behind, at least 1.5 to 2 centimeters behind the nasolabial fold. So when you're raising a tongue-shaped nasolabial fold, uh, nasolabial flap, the chances of you injuring the facial nerve is absolutely, um, absolutely nil. So, you know, because why am I talking about, uh, you know, facial nerve uh, in these flaps is that is the fear, you know, that we always wonder whether we would damage something and cause further, um, uh, further morbidity for the patient. And therefore, uh, you know, stop that, that fear stops us from doing any surgery for that matter. So a nasolabial flap would include, would be somewhere here, you would be taking it you know, uh, a width of around two to three centimeters can be taken from the anterior to the posterior, around one centimeter from the, uh, from the corner of the mouth, the commissure of the mouth. And it could include skin, fat, um, and the expression muscles and the mucosa, depending on how much thickness you want to cover the defect. So you could have different types of nasolabial flap, uh, flap the buried flap, which is a skinless flap, the defatted flap, which would, in, which would only have the dermis and the epidermis, the ordinary flap, which is usually taken, which is the dermis, epidermis, and the subcutaneous uh, fat, the myocutaneous flap, which would include the uh, uh, expression muscles also, or the full thickness flap, which would include the buccal mucosa also. So this here on the left, you can see an inferiorly based flap, it's a tongue-shaped flap. It is in the uh, you know, in the uh, uh, nasolabial fold. So you know that the, the facial nerve is at least a centimeter behind that. And so you need, don't need to worry. And it is, it goes, when you have an inferiorly based flap, it goes based on the uh, facial artery. And when you have a superiorly based flap like this, it is based on the angular artery. So you're giving an incision through skin, subcutaneous tissue, fat, and if you only want that much, then that's a tongue of flap that you have with only that tissue. If you want the expression muscle also, you take the incision further down. Then you may have some bleeding from the superior labial vessels or the inferior labial vessels, which are easy to uh, diathermize. And then if you want the mucosa, you could go even down to mucosa. And what is the structure that you are going to be worried about with just you know one centimeter from the commissure? You're not going to have the parotid uh, uh, duct. The duct is very much behind. So you don't need to worry uh, about the parotid duct. So no structure, very safe flap that you can uh, use and you can raise. Uh, this, is a, this is a case where we, have, we had a CA of the upper lip, which was excised and a wedge and excision was done. And uh, um, we uh, did a bilateral nasolabial flap and uh, uh, reconstructed it in that manner. And the patient was happy, disease free and happy. So uh, uh, with that, we finish with the nasolabial flap and next we come to the platysma flap. The platysma flap actually uh, had lost its, uh, you know, its, uh, 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 the surgeons were like uh, given up on platysma flap for quite some time. If you look into literature, there's not much literature on the platysma flap. Why is it so? Because it's actually a very thin flap, uh, thin muscle actually. It's a, it's a rudimentary muscle which comes from the pectoral and deltoid region and up to the, you know, up to the lower border of mandible and goes, uh, continues with the uh, uh, smash of the uh, facial region. So this platysma, what happens is with, with age, it becomes very thin and therefore it lost its uh, its attraction to for the surgeons to be used as uh, as a flap, but now it seems to have gained uh, uh, popularity, and uh, uh, there are surgeons who seem to be using it for small small to medium defects. And the uh, arterial supply for the platysma is uh, it's got a fantastic arterial supply. Actually, it's got the submental from top, the superior thyroid from this middle, the occipital from behind, and the transverse cervical from the inferior. So you have a lot a lot of um, you know uh, vasculature coming into the uh, the platysma muscle, which is a sheath which goes up from the clavicle upwards to the uh, uh, lower border of mandible. 
and uh, uh, you know uh, you could use it uh, for tumors involving the buccal mucosa and uh, for the lower lip and uh, when you want to create a deep sulcus in the vestibular region lower vestibular region so this is a case where just to show you i have never done a platysma flap so here uh, uh, you know you can see that they have taken a small skin paddle also raised the skin and uh, and that is the platysma that you see there with the skin paddle and that is rotated round to uh, and uh, tunneled medially to uh, uh, reconstruct a small defect in the lateral border of post uh, lateral border of the tongue so the advantages of a platysma flap is that you can use it to re because it's thin and pliable no and its proximity uh, it it can be rotated it has got a great arc of rotation because it's so thin you can even rotate it to 180 degrees of uh, rotation and uh, very simple to raise and it can be used for uh, uh, the lingual uh, flap uh, on the uh, for reconstructing defects in the uh, on the of the tongue uh the problem again because it's thin uh, lack of bulk it cannot be used when you have a big defect and uh if it is a male then you can have hair growth and uh, if you have if the patient has undergone uh, chemo or radio then there is a chance of uh, necrosis so that's a, a recent article where uh, it's actually a short communication that in 2016 of a platysma flap that was used in, a, in an osteoradio necrosis case uh, which was not relenting to any uh, any uh, form of treatment and here they have taken uh, what you see there as two uh, that's a fistula that you see there that has been marked and that is two skin paddles we earlier saw one skin paddle no here they've taken two they've planned out two skin paddles so that one could be used for the extraoral fistula and one was used to uh, close the uh, um the defect the intraoral defect now here uh, they did not have uh, in the short communication they did not have the post operative uh, pictures but they say that uh, it is a very useful uh, it was a very useful flap for this case so it seems to be a a flap that we can also try so coming to the submental flap so we went from forehead to temporalis to uh, uh, nasolabial to uh, uh platysma and now the submental submental is excuse me ma'am if i yes. can come in yes 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 ma'am if you don't mind there are some questions related to the previous flap so can Great. we take them now yes, or do you yes. want uh dr shubhra well, i mean yeah, whenever you are yeah ma'am no ma'am like we'll just stop so that they won't be yeah. confused for the yeah. older just one yeah. or two we'll just take yeah yeah definitely that ma'am right. first starting with the forehead Yeah. uh like you have done few and you showed us marvelous results like which is like um, you say it's an ugly flap but it did serve the purpose so Correct. what is like a larger largest defect you think you have you would have done with it yeah so what is the largest defect that you would yeah, want yeah like no? approximately we... what size do you think the defect we can take up a forehead flap because generally yeah. with such things we always Correct. think of bipedical pmmc Correct. you know Correct. or Correct. or or dp with a pmmc and Correct. you showed Correct. results with actually forehead so correct correct so so the you know with the forehead flap that's the limitation one is the 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 thinness of the flap the other is the width the width of the forehead flap will uh, will be uh, determined by the the width of your forehead so uh, you know 4 cm 3.5 to 4 cm is the the width that you would you would uh, of a defect that you would be able to uh, a cover with a comfortably with a forehead flap uh, so if you have a larger defect and uh, you could do a pmmc is the option so i think a 3 3 to 3.5 cm width of a defect would be a good uh, option for a forehead flap if it is being considered and if you cannot do a pmmc flap but a pmmc flap is always a good option you know the advantage of a forehead flap over pmmc is uh, obviously obviously the force of gravity you know uh, a pmmc is a great flap i i love the pmmc flap but i'm just saying just for a um, discussion well, what happens many times with the pmmc flap it's a bulky flap and it's pulled down by yeah, the exactly. contraction of the muscle so many a times i have a uh, wound dehiscence in the superior you know aspect of the wound uh, of the you know of the defect you 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 have uh, the the flap pulling off and you have it opening out which will not happen with a forehead flap the diff difficulty with forehead flap is that uh, uh you know uh, the thinness of the flap and you cannot if it's a defect more than 3 to 4 centi 3 cm uh you may have to uh, think of uh, uh another flap 
yeah and, not, yeah, not and maybe we need some uh, lining for lining also we need some other a flap in case of a forehead flap a forehead flap i have shown you one where i have folded it actually you can okay. fold it yeah you can fold it also if you've taken a flap across the forehead and uh, you know up to the opposite contralateral uh, uh, superficial temporal uh, artery you can you can even fold it and uh, use it yeah okay. and ma'am there's a question uh, there's a question regarding uh, is it possible to use it for orbital defects like we know temporalis is generally the one we use it and you did show a result with temporalis Yeah. Have you yeah. ever used it or seen? No. Because I, I haven't, haven't seen it being no, used. I haven't seen it and you used it for orbit. The problem with using it in the orbit, no, that's a very good question. The problem with using it for the orbit is it's too close a uh, uh, an area, and uh, you know uh, if you take uh, the kinking of the vessel can be more, and uh, also. uh when you have a temporalis which is uh, more bulkier and you you need to obturate the orbit you're talking about orbital exoneration right yes, when you yes. obturate the uh, orbit you would want more bulk so bulk. Uh, yeah so you would want you would prefer to use a temporalis flap rather than a forehead flap so there uh, is a question yes ma'am sorry no yeah. uh, about the how do you close the donor site so uh, we generally from a laterally basis uh, ssg right that's the general yes, choice yes yes that's what it was done there a split thickness uh, skin graft yes thickness uh, so we always all, take you it over to. the zygoma right ma'am yes. that's how yes yes and that's what we later do. divide it yes so that's right we also we used to do is that the small pedicle which is left behind yeah. that could be replaced back Correct. I believe you from can, the lateral, so a small part of the thing you get back as a normal, correct. Correct. and then the skin graft can be that. Correct. So correct. So that can be done. Yes. Look correct. of the SSG. Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, Ma'am, so there's one question. Uh, are, hmm? Sorry. as you are there dr shubhra uh, you know i just want to share a few experiences one is uh, when you're taking the forehead flap down you can tube the flap you can tube right the now. pedicle no you can tube it so that it's not open the yes, other thing is you can you can tunnel it in you can tunnel it through the tissues and brain so when you tunnel what i had i had a problem was you can have a, a sebum inside the wound you know and you have a sebaceous kind of a because you know you have that skin uh, uh, in the tissue if you haven't uh, deepithelized the skin that is going into the tunnel when you're right tunneling now. it you know you can have sebum and you, uh, i've had that complication because i hadn't deepithelized so it's good to deepithelize if you're going to tunnel it in and take it into the intraoral defect yeah we actually yeah. generally use it with the without tunneling yeah shubhra yeah. can i ask a question here yes sir uh, there there's a question from the audience and uh, it says that which is the best regional flap option in the reconstruction of whole wide palatal defect can we reconstruct with a temporalis muscle flap whole wide uh, palate right yeah. palatal defect yeah the, you, that means the whole of the palate is uh, a defect right yeah. Yeah. so actually uh, temporalis can be used you if you can mobilize it what will uh, the problem with it is uh, you will have to osteotomize the zygoma to mobilize it that much you know uh, you will have to osteotomize the zygoma to otherwise it will not come to the whole defect dr shubhra do you agree to that i think shubhra is gone off. and plus i think we need a bilateral temporalis flap in cases where it is a wide yes, palatal that defect. is exactly or unilateral exactly. wound reach yes that's right you, you may have to do a even with the zygomatic uh, if you have osteotomized the zygoma and still not getting a reach then uh, as dr abilasha said uh, bilateral uh, temporalis is good Yeah, and actually the question I was about to ask that. So we do have to sometimes. Uh, what is your take on uh, osteotomy of the zygoma, ma'am, for the temporalis flap? Uh, yeah, yeah. When do we so, wait, and for which cases, or can we leave it for few cases? How is it like? I don't osteotomize usually for any. Uh, I haven't done an osteotomy of the uh, zygoma for uh, temporalis reach. Uh, right. No, I haven't done. I haven't done. but you can it's not a big deal because you are opening up the temporalis with the you know uh, coronal approach and you're seeing the zygoma and if right. you as if uh, as dr shinoy was asking for the uh, you know the palate and you find that the, it's not reaching the palate then you can osteotomize the zygoma and uh, uh, reach the the only problem there is you have to be careful to know where your frontal uh, nerve branches and you should be away from there when you're osteotomizing the zygoma that's what i would think 
yeah any okay. other and uh, yes ma'am and ma'am there is another question on the complications for nasolabial ma'am ah complications with nasolabial specific nasal because we know it's a simple flap and you yeah. did show that uh, we can now initially we used to always leave a base for the flap in your second pictures which you show yeah uh, and you used to tunnel it and later there will be a small fistula over there Correct. or uh, what we will be doing is that we'll be dividing it uh, but Correct. now you did show us a first picture of the nasal level which it is islanded perfectly and you don't have to yeah. worry about Correct. it Correct. that Correct. you should see the pedicle that will be yes that that yeah the any anything which you think we should be careful for a nasal level or we can land up in an issue with the nasal level a uh, nasal labial island flap or a nasal labial uh, anything for that matter ma'am like generally yeah, any with a nasal labial island, island yeah with a nasal labial island flap what you need to be careful about is the uh, uh, that you identify the uh, superior labial branch of the uh, facial artery all right uh, what you need to understand is uh, in the anatomy the facial artery as it courses from the uh, uh, you know from the angle of the mandible uh, from the sorry not angle of the mandible from the lower border of the mandible to the uh, medial canthus uh, and the facial vein as it courses upwards they actually diverge there's a lot of space uh, a lot of space in the sense 1.5 to 2 cent 1.8 cm uh, space between the artery and the vein so uh, uh, you are in a very comfortable position and you you no chance of you uh, damaging the facial vein or the uh, uh, you know or the uh, facial nerve so uh, uh, the ch uh, you know uh, complications with uh, nasolabial flap is uh, i would say nil nil uh, <laughs> if you need to if you need to uh, uh, think of a complication it's it is just that you need you have another uh, um, surgery that you need to do to deep pedicle is one not a complication sir it's a disadvantage disadvantage, but, uh, disadvantage. complication would be if you have not taken the plane properly you have if you have not understood you know skin subcutaneous tissue Uh, fat sometimes some chubby ones have fat so fat and then you come to the expression muscles and then you have to identify you know where you are in which area you are orient yourself um, imagine your facial artery uh, you know uh, uh, course the superior labial vessel may come in uh, in your in your uh, vision then identify mm -hmm. it yeah yeah if i can add ma'am uh, yeah. maybe in the post operative period uh, the participants might be like want to ask that okay in a okay. male patient you can have hair growth hair inside growth. the oral yes. cavity yes yes plus if you are mobilizing closing it if you are mobilizing uh, your medial portion yes then there can be widening of the commissure of mouth that can be one complication uh, plus if you are uh, in a case of say suppose an oral submucous fibrosis if you are planning to take a nasal labial flap in those situation if you are extending your incision way far i mean up till your corner of mouth so while closure or post operatively in the healing phase you can have a fish mouth deformity correct 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 that's a very good uh, very good right. input yeah i think i've lost uh, power here i hope my net your screen is visible, visible ma'am your screen is okay. visible okay. you're audible ma'am yeah yeah and uh, ma'am just to the continuation of what you know so was asking there was there's one question from an audience in mean, the participant he wants to know that if you osteotomize the zygoma it will lead to malar flattening of the malar prominence so does it uh, needs to be reconstructed okay uh, uh, yeah zygomatic arch will not cause flattening of the malar prominence our malar prominence is because of the zygoma bone the bone zygoma so arch will not cause uh, you know flattening of the uh, malar prominence and uh, you could even osteotomize and replate huh? that's another thing you can do exactly. yeah yeah and not because it will cause uh, flattening it does not cause flattening of the malar prominence yeah thank you ma'am ma there was another question that yeah. uh, you mentioned that in temporalis there is going to be hollowing temporalis yeah. hollowing as a disadvantage yeah. so is yeah. there any way we can fill it up <laughs> yeah actually uh, you know you know we are talking about uh, reconstruction of defects in usually uh, uh, elderly individuals so uh, the hollowing does not really worry them but worry of course them. yeah but of course you can uh, you know uh, fill it with uh, tissue expanders and things like you know uh, many a times uh, what we need to understand as surgeons uh, this uh, uh, you know young uh, all of us when we were young or when i was young uh, we we like to get adventurous 
uh, mm-hmm. and think of all sorts of uh, even when we answer why was no you ask a question and we come up with the most complicated answers the simple answers never come up so we should keep our surgeries uh, as simple as possible because that's the best for the uh, uh, patient and we should always ask ourselves will i get this done for myself all right but uh the question is a very good question a uh, temporal hollowing you can do tissue expanders not as a primary uh you know immediately during that uh, say it can be done as a staged procedure you know later on uh mm-hmm. assess the hollowing after the healing and all that and then do a, a tissue expander i think i think okay. that is- and actually speaking ma'am you are can ask the patient to grow more hair, like lengthen his yeah, hair and grow her and actually get correct correct dr shubhra yes that's very correct so ma'am there's another yeah, one for the nasolabial uh, that is there a possibility of a salivary leak with nasolabial when used for o- osmf patients do you okay. think okay that- okay okay i have never seen it in literature actually nasolabial flap with saliva why would we have a salivary leak with uh, osmf yeah, for- we should no, have i don't think we're we not going have- to that i think because ma'am they may be correlating it that hello so- ma'am Uh, yeah 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 uh, hello ma'am suchmita here ma'am hi hello hi yes. suchmita hi, ma'am, uh, ma'am uh, i have been extensively using uh, this uh, uh, extended nasal label flap for uh, oh. this uh, submucous fibrosis cases but uh, i don't think parotid should be a issue as long as you don't cut it when you are releasing the fibrosis intra orally yeah absolutely yeah. that in so it has got nothing to do with the flap Correct, it correct. has got to do parotid leakage has got to do with where you are placing your release of the fibrosis incision inside the mouth hmm. that is yeah. the, yeah. could, could, be, could be that it's got confused that you take the flap uh, through and through as a defect but uh, the thing we need to understand is the flap as ma'am has explained is going to the skin subcutaneous and the fat layer so we if you're not confused with the layers then i don't think it's possible that you can go damage the Uh, no that is somewhere uh, the, that whole uh, anatomy is different if you have to reach the parotid from outside and cut that is a whole wholly different the dissection yeah, that, no there's a wrong plane of dissection correct so you so cannot reach the possibility yes yes correct yes so, ma'am i think yeah. we can start excellent presentation the ma'am continue thank ma'am you. excellent thank presentation you. thank you so much thank you so much so, ma'am getting delay yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so submental so, flap yeah yeah, yeah. Sub, mm-hmm. submental flap so we're talking about the next flap that we're talking about is a submental flap now just look at the uh, the picture that you have there there is a arrow showing you the submental branch of the facial artery the internal the external maxillary artery or the facial artery so the submental uh, branch is uh, you know given off just below the lower border of the ma- uh, mandible and uh, uh you know uh, that is something that you need to keep in mind when i as i'm going to explain the submental uh, uh flap all right now this is again a fascio cutaneous flap that means fascia and uh, skin and fascia all right but it can include the muscle that is the anterior belly of digastric and the mylohyoid also if you want more bulk all right and uh, this is a actual pattern flap uh, obviously because it is based on the submental uh, uh branch of the facial artery right so and uh, it it is a, you know it can be used for defects in the oral cavity the lower part of the oral cavity uh, that is the you know the lip the the floor of the mouth the uh, uh, alveolar region all right um, even uh, right up to the retromolar trigone you can have the submental flap uh, extending because you have the pedicle uh, which can be uh, you know uh, you can have a pedicle length of almost 8 cm and uh, a very versatile flap actually the only disadvantage is you know when you are doing uh, onco surgery and you have level 1 nodes um, uh, then using a submental flap may be difficult uh, that's that's why uh, it's not used very often so uh, so how do you know how much of submental flap you can use the best test is to do a pinch test and uh, the advantage in elderly people is that they have that jowl no the the chin jowl so when you pinch that you know how much of uh, submental flap you can uh, raise uh, so w- once you have determined the uh, the amount of submental flap that you can raise you you uh, draw the uh, draw out the uh, area and then give the incision through skin uh, you know superficial fascia platysma go down to in the hyoid region you go down to the hyoid release the anterior belly of digastric from the hyoid from and then superiorly from the lower border of mandible and then you uh, you know dissect it out upwards 
to the submental uh, you know you, you you lift up the flap as you're going and uh, and in that plane up to the submental vessel you you identify the submental vessel which is branching out from the facial artery and there uh, you may you may get you may get a few branches of the facial artery that is going to the uh, submandibular salivary gland which may need to because you should not ligate and cut the sub uh, the facial artery because then you're going to lose the 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 blood blood supply to the flap so the small branches that are given to the the gland the glandular branches need to be um, uh, ligated and then you raise the flap upwards and uh, in order to get more length to the flap what you can do is as i told you earlier here what you can do is you can ligate the facial artery uh, can you see my yeah you can ligate the facial artery up here all right if you ligate the facial artery up here as it is you know going upwards into the face <clears throat> you get more length <clears throat> another thing is the posterior belly of digastric can be uh, sectioned so you get more mobility to the flap right and uh, that is a good way of uh, doing uh, you know mobilizing the uh, uh, flap and taking it up and it can be you you know tunneled medially through the uh, uh, medial to the uh, body of the mandible and uh, lining the to line the floor of the mouth or it can be tunneled lateral to the floor of the mouth and uh, used for the uh, uh, lateral defect La I, mean, I mean lateral in the sense lateral to the uh, body of the mandible so complete th this uh, flap you have uh, you know you 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 have uh, almost uh, you know uh, uh, you can take around 8 cm by uh, 3 cm to 4 cm width depending on the jowl that you have and uh, you you have a good width that can be used for any defect in the lower uh, lower jaw region and uh, as i said earlier it is skin fascia the muscle that can be included is the uh, anterior belly of digastric you can even uh, uh, you can even take a part of the mylohyoid with it and to get more length what you could do is ligate the facial artery at a higher level that is above the branching off of the submental artery you ligate the facial artery you could dissect the digastric uh, muscle to get more mobility so that it reaches the retromolar trigone as you see here right and uh, there is a submental this is the submental island flap that is the same you can see the facial artery here and uh, sorry i'm having a problem so you can see the facial artery there and you can see the facial vein there joining the common facial vein so that is the the pedicle that you can see that is skeletonized and that is the mobility that you get with the, the submental island flap so then you come to the deltopectoral flap the deltopectoral flap again uh, is not a muscular musculocutaneous flap it is a fasciocutaneous flap though it is called deltopectoral it is because of the region on which it is lying it is lying over the pectoral and the deltoid right and the uh, uh, vessel the vascular supply is the perforating branches of the internal mammary artery and uh, the incision this is another beautiful uh, you know flap that can be raised to uh, um to uh, uh reconstruct defects of the lower facial uh, uh region and uh, it's a it's a broad based flap which uh, um, uh which uh, which gets its blood supply from the first three or four into no. so that's the flap that you can raise Hi, over, the, over the uh, pectoralis muscle and the deltoid muscle you know it, so it's a fascia cutaneous that is raised like that it can be used to uh, reconstruct any of those defects in the lower uh, lower facial region, the neck region, even a defect in the uh, contralateral chest region. The advantages are, of course, the ideal. That's a typical delto tubed deltopectoral flap. You tube it so that it does not, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, get infected. And uh, the disadvantage is that you know you have a, a tendency to, you know, the the position of the head is in a very awkward position. Mobility is not there, and it has a tendency to pull down because of gravity. And uh, the donor site needs a grafting. What you see there is a skin grafting. Yeah. So coming to the trapezius muscle, the trapezius muscle is a huge muscle, a huge muscle on the back. Yeah, it uh, it uh, it extends from the uh, uh, the external occipital uh, protuberance right down to the twelfth thoracic vertebra. 
right? And uh, so it has three parts. It has a descending part, it has a transverse part, and it has an ascending part. What you see on top is a descending part, descending down from the external occipital pr protuberance to the scapula, the acromion process of the scapula, the transverse part, and the, um, uh, the ascending part from the uh, 12th thoracic vertebrae to the scapula. So it, it has uh, blood supply from the transverse cervical artery superiorly, the dorsal scapula artery, and the perforating blood vessels from the intercostal system of the uh, through its paraspinous, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, portion. So uh, as I said earlier, uh, you know, you have that huge flap there. You can uh, large large defects can be uh, uh, can be. Um, uh, uh, restored by this uh, flap. Uh, so you have uh, the origin from the, uh, you know, uh, external occipital protuberance, the ligamentum nuque, the uh, spinous process of the C7, and then coming down to right up to the T12, you will have the uh, uh, origin. The uh, uh, insertion is towards the you know, the clavicle, the lateral part of the clavicle and the scapula, the spine of the scapula and uh, the acromion process. So it, in this article, they show us the muscle-only flap of the trapezius that has been raised and uh, um, uh, used to close the defect of the scalp and uh, skin grafting being done over the uh, muscle flap and which has taken up very well. I have not done a trapezius flap. In this uh, um, you know, article in 2017, where they have done uh, trapezius flaps for uh, uh, recon they have done a systematic review of uh, the trapezius flap for head and neck defects, a systematic review of almost 30 years of articles, you know, where they have uh, uh, chosen 17 studies which, uh, uh, which met their inclusion criteria. And they said that trapezius flaps are reliable myocutaneous flaps for both primary and for salvage surgery. So it is, so obviously, you know, look at that, uh, look at that amount of, uh, 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 you know, tissue that you will get the amount of the flap that you will get. And with muscle, it's quite a thick flap. So, and it's a wide arc of rotation, like how you, we said with the platysma, the trapezius also has a wide arc of rotation and it can be used in, area, in areas which have been previously irradiated and where previous surgical procedures uh, have limited the use of free flaps. So uh, that is the uh, advantage of uh, 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 trapezius muscle flap. The disadvantage is that it, its venous system is very difficult to preserve. That and uh, and of course, if you have uh, uh, you know injured the trip, uh, the spinal axillary, you may cause a winging of the scapula and uh, shoulder drop postoperatively. This is one of my cases where we had done a resection. We did a PMMC. We uh, uh, the patient underwent radiotherapy and uh, a microvascular was out of question. So a trapezius flap was done for this patient with a large defect and uh, beautifully taken up uh, post radiation uh, for. Uh, this case. And uh, look at that uh, donor site. It's a very acceptable donor site scar, can be covered, which is covered by the clothing. So the next is the pectoralis major myocutaneous, which is a workhorse of uh, head and neck reconstruction and which is uh, my uh, favorite flap. And I think most of our surgeons favorite flap. And uh, here in the picture, if you see the origin is from the medial third of the clavicle, the sternum and the cartilages of the first six uh, you know, the first six ribs, you can see that picture there. It's that fan-shaped flap, no? It goes into the uh, crest of the greater tubercle of the humerus. You can see that there. So this flap can reach right up to the zygoma, a beautiful flap. And, uh, uh, you know, what you can see on the right on that uh, um, picture is that shaded area is the available skin uh, surface. And you can see that uh, beautiful uh, Vascular, a vascular supply from the pectoralis branch of the acromiothoracic uh, uh, thoracoacromion vessel. And uh, uh, the innervation, uh, the problem with this um, uh, flap is when you take, no, you may, you may denervate it and therefore it can atrophy with time. That is uh, one of the problems with the uh, uh, pectoralis major flap. This is an article by uh, Kiran Gadre where uh, he has uh, published uh, in 2013, and he says that uh, the pectoralis major flap is a fantastic flap for, where, especially in a country like India, where there's a high incidence of head and neck uh, uh, malignancies. And uh, in his 19 years ex experience, he finds that the functional uh, and cosmetic results are very st satisfactory with this sturdy flap. He has done almost 496 cases of reconstruction with uh, 
pectoralis major. Miller et al. has also said that in his, um, you know, this is an article again in 2017, where uh, in modern head and neck free flap practice, uh, where his institution does a lot of free flap, and still he says that a pectoralis major myocutaneous flap is a good flap, which can be associated with uh, uh, a very good uh, success. This is a, a article by uh, Dr. Moni Kuriakos and his team, and uh, he has uh, uh, said that from the data of his study, he finds that the pectoralis major flap is a flap which uh, can be used in uh, a developing country like ours, where resource constraints is a major deciding factor. So the different types of the pec flap is a full paddle, idle, uh, island, sorry, muscle paddle, free microvascular. So the one which I do very often and I find many people doing very often is a muscle paddle flap because it's a safest flap and the pedicle is well protected by the muscle paddle, right? And uh, the uh, landmarks are uh, the um, sternal notch, the acromio, uh, you know, the acromio, uh, acromio clavicular joint, the... Uh, uh, midline of the clavicle, the ziphy sternum, those are the, uh, the uh, you know, your landmarks that you need to uh, think. And this is how you would give an incision. The tagging of the uh, skin, skin to, the pad, uh, to the muscle is very important so that shearing does not happen. The skin uh, uh, identification of the perforator is very important. So that is uh, the, you know, that, that is uh, the way you would want to draw. So I will show you a video where, uh, you know, how we need to uh, 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 mark your landmarks. And uh, that is a picture which shows at least four of your fingers should go through that tunnel that is created in the neck to, uh, uh, you know, tunnel your flap up to the, uh, up to the facial uh, area. So the key steps to be followed during PMMZ harvesting is the identification of the landmarks, the marking out of the incision, uh, the uh, uh, making the, you know, uh, uh, incising the flap, uh, identifying the pectoralis major uh, uh, muscle, developing the medial and lateral flaps. Yeah, you may even include the nipple, the periareolar area has got a lot of good blood supply, even that can be if it's a large defect uh, and tagging the uh, uh, the uh, skin so that you don't shear the uh, perforator vessels, perforator to the skin. That is another thing that is important for you to do. And identifying the pedicle. If you can actually appreciate the pedicle here, uh, that is the pedicle that you can see, right? The uh, uh, thoracoacromian vessel. And that tunnel is very important. You need to have at least four fingers going easily through that so that you don't kink your vessel. So the types of defects that can be reconstructed with PMMC, you can have an anti-gum deformity. This, this patient is doing very well. A central defect, we say we, you know, the patient may have an anti-gum and may not be able to swallow, may, may have a respiratory embarrassment. This patient is doing very well for years now with a PMMC flap. We actually uh, reconstructed her with a, a, a reconstruction plate, but that got infected and we, she, was remained, she remained with the PMMC flap. A lateral defect like this is also uh, a good... Uh, uh, area to be reconstructed with PMMC. Even a commissure, uh, you know, a bipedal flap with a commissure defect can be reconstructed with the PMMC. An intraoral defect can be. A lateral defect, an obese patient, a female patient can be uh, reconstructed with a PMMC uh, flap. And the primary uh, donor site can be easily closed. The donor site can be closed easily with the primary closure uh, using a drain, and uh, that is an advantage with the PMMC flap. Uh, of course, you can have, you know, failures with PMMC flap is, uh, you know, fortunately very, very less, but uh, you could have wound dehiscence like this. You could have dehiscence which, you know, opens out like this, but still with just, with just dressing, 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 you can, you, it just heals very well. You don't even need to suture it together. You just need to approximate a little bit and then keep dressing. For this patient, I remember we even used the, uh, the sanitary napkin to you know, place it there so that we taught him how to clean and to place that napkin and put a tape on top because he couldn't come often. And uh, this is how we saw, we saw it healing. So uh, the advantage of the PMMC flap is that it's a one-stage flap, highly reliable flap, large skin uh, territory. Uh, you don't need to change the position of the patient. And uh, you have the muscular, especially if you're doing a, a neck dissection where you're removing the sternocleidomastoid, this muscle would uh, uh, cause a muscle cover for the carotid artery.
there's a uh, disadvantage of course is the uh, you know it, it it may not be ha having a very good arc of rotation to reach the maxillary defects shoulder disability and pedicle compression and of course uh, hair growth also is the problem there now this is a short video that we can see uh, so uh, you know the incision marking so that's the sternal notch that is marked ma'am the video hasn't st started ma'am it's playing here yes yes ma'am we can see ma'am it's playing that's, okay. okay yeah that's the mid midline of the clavicle and that's your you know that's the fan shaped pectoralis major myocutaneous flap right that's the fan shaped pectoralis major myocutaneous flap okay and that is the diaphragm or the rectus abdominis would come there right so we are marking the flap right And then you give an incision through skin. You can use a diathermy to go once you've incised. And there you have the fat exposed. And as you're incising, you are going on a bevel outwards so that you get as much perforators as possible to the skin. All right. So that's how you need to, you need to bevel outwards so that you get more perforate, not bevel inwards. All right. So there you can see the fascia. Yeah. So that's the incision. That's the lateral incision. That was, a, yeah, the lateral incision up to the fascia till we see the muscle you can see the red muscle on that's on the medial side that's the pectoralis muscle right Let's see you can see after the fat what you're seeing is the pectoralis muscle you have to uh, that's the lateral border that is very important that you you uh, define the lateral border you're tagging the uh, suturing the uh, skin to the muscle so that you don't shear Okay, we'll go to the next one. So that's the lateral border. So first thing is, I would say define the lateral border and then raise from the lateral upwards. That flap you should not touch. That's very sacred. If you keep touching and that skin paddle, no? You may be, you may shear the 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 perforator. So so can you see that the lateral border is defined, and then you're very safely going, separating the pectoralis major from the minor. Right. Yeah. So as you're incising lateral, inferior, and medial, you don't need to worry. So it's only. As you're lifting up, you will be able to see the pedicle. Can you see that pedicle there? Yeah. As you get close to the pedicle, it's advisable not to use the uh, diathermy, especially the mon monopolar. And now you are, uh, you know, using the uh, flap to reconstruct the defect. This was an obese lady. And... Uh, uh, and we could not suture all or all around. There was a lot of fat there. But uh, believe me, all that epithelized over time. You don't need to, don't, don't get the feeling that you have to suture everything and tie it all up. It's okay if you have bulges of tissues like that because that epithelizes with time. I think with that, we'll come to the question. Dr. Yeah, I'll just launch it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the uh, this for the audience on Zoom. 
I'm putting out two questions which have been uh, sent by uh, Dr. Reena. You need to uh, click on the option you feel is right, okay? There are two questions and there they are. So question one is latissimus dorsi flap is of which type? So kindly vote for it. We started the, yes, it's coming in. Dr. Abhilasha, are we shooting, yeah. overshooting time? I think it's 6.20, is it okay? I think we'll, I, we'll finish fast, yeah? Yeah. Is it okay with y'all? I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am, it's perfect, ma'am. No problem. I'm very well explaining each of them and we are listening with full I, attention. I, I hope. <laughs> I hope. Uh, the participants on YouTube, you can also type your questions there if you want. Though it won't be counted in the poll results, but still... Ma'am, we'll just take two questions after the poll and start. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, uh, shall I close it? No, we have people are still voting. Can you vote fast, guys? Because there's so much of things to be learned from Dr. Reena. <laughs> I so the ex answer. Yeah. Okay. So... I know you're not going to get any, uh, your grades are not going to be because of this. So I'll end the poll. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Reena, you'll have to discuss the results. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'll share the results. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think the latissimus dorsi is a flap, is a googly, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, if we remember, uh, you know, uh, Mathis Nahai, it's very difficult. Even I for keep forgetting all these pedicles and all that. But uh, just remember the PMMC and the uh, latissimus dorsi have, have one dominant pedicle and multiple segmental secondary pedicles. Okay. The, uh, like for PMMC, you have one dominant that is the uh, pectoralis branch, no? the uh, thoracoacromian uh, vessel coming down there, we saw that pedicle. And then you have the internal mammary vessels, which are the secondary segmental pedicle. So it's a type five, right? We have around 22% who have answered it, right? And um, the maxillary posterior alveolar defect, uh, you know, that's posterior there. So temporalis can uh, sort of come in very well. The fam flap is the, we're going to talk about it actually, the facial artery musculo, myo, um, um, musculo myo, uh, mucosal flap musculomucosal flap and the nasolabial flap, these all have good reach to the, uh, to the posterior alveolar defect. But the submental flap, unless you have uh, taken an island, even that reaching to the posterior alveolar defect is a little difficult. So uh, uh, that would be, the, and that I think 66% of you have got it right. So that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, we'll Thank go you. ahead. Yeah, yeah. ma'am, ma just a small question. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, like, how is your take on doing a free fibula after we have done PMMC? Oh, like, we have uh, done a PMC and then we plan anything which has to be yeah. taken care or how, how difficult, easy is it to do it? Okay. So uh, uh, after, uh, you know, like the, like the cases I showed you, you know, with the central defect actually, which needs a free fibula. Uh, if you have to do a, a fibula after that, it's basically you'll, uh, it's, it's just like dissection through... Uh, uh, scar tissue or uh, dissection through uh, uh, the muscle. The only thing is you wouldn't have the same planes as as you would have for a primary uh, uh, reconstruction. Uh, but you can develop a uh, uh, th that that would be your uh, your uh, challenge. challenge, I think. Uh, describe. I mean, defining the planes would be a challenge. Creating a tunnel for uh, you know uh, putting in the uh, uh, to tunnel the fibula in may be a challenge. Uh, because, but because when the moment we add bone, ma'am, maybe the space will increase, and we may need a skin pedal from the fibula itself to you cover definitely, it. Definitely, yeah, yeah, that you def you will definitely need. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, ma'am. And another thing, somebody has asked that: Do you do you what do you think about taking PMMC externally? It like everything is generally we want to hide the thing, so we don't like ugly scars in forehead and all. But uh, there is a question which says that: uh, have, Do you think about taking a PMMC externally. So, 
I really I, because it's primarily tunneling because when it's easy to tunnel below the skin. Ah, so okay, 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 okay. You mean tubing that PMMC flap, right? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Uh, 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 tunneling. Yeah. yeah actually you know uh, shubhra when we don't uh, uh, remove the uh, sternocleidomaster in the neck to section no uh, then you then i actually tube the uh, pmmc flap because if you put the uh, uh, over the sternocleidomaster it many a times i cannot put the neck flaps back it it's open uh, sometimes so tubing it's not bad to tube the uh, pmmc flap and uh, say, you saw the trapezius flap right that uh, that's not mine uh, that's actually a muscle flap that has been uh, saying that they they have uh, done a, a flap over it uh, and they have only grafted it on the defect so the remaining was just open you can just dress it round yeah so, so you're you the muscle part of maybe uh, how are you telling it ma'am yeah tube the muscle part and uh, dress it uh, that's what you would uh, do and um, you know you need to dress it that is very important because the pedicle have... is lying there no ma'am yes 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 so you will have to then then ma'am uh, will it require the second surgery like of uh, yes definitely you will need. yes 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 you will need after 3 to 4 weeks you will need to dissect uh, uh, you know deep pedicle the flap yes actually i have instead also seen mom taking it below the clavicle though i haven't done it ah, still ah that's uh, a very i have read it in order to avoid the yes. bulge uh, yeah, over I the know. clavicle which is ugly after maybe a year or two so correct, people have correct. started taking it uh, below the yeah. skin that Ma'am, that's a very good uh, thing but uh, i i wouldn't dare doing it do it because <laughs> you have the apex yeah. of the lung sometimes there right and... right ma'am so that's yeah. the only thing so you have the clavicle and you go so yeah. you can do it so at this point no i want to uh, you know i want to uh, thank uh, the one who taught me to do a pmmc flap it's the it's an onco surgeon from uh, polo hospital dr cs money uh, you know uh, so what i want to tell my young ones is uh, never feel bad uh, to ask another uh, you know special they may be from other specialty they may be from our own specialty but uh, there are a lot of people who are out there ready to help us it's only a matter of asking so don't let our ego come in the way and uh, it's a, it's a good way to learn from whoever is ready to teach us here we have dr shinoy and his team dr abhilasha who is ready to you know there are people like this who are ready to teach us so just take the hand that is stretched out to us and it takes us a long way i would never have done a pmmc flap if it was not for dr cs money i thank him for that yeah very good message ma'am very good message thank you thank you, thank you so much so latismus dorsi shall we go with that Ma'am, there's yeah. one more small question. Uh, yeah. I'm also not sure with the answer actually. Uh, it's regarding the submental artery flap. Uh, will the submental artery flap be reliable when it is not supplied by the SMA, like the submental artery directly, but by the lingual artery? Because they say mm. that the when where the artery ends, there is a connection with the lingual artery also for the uh, that area. That paddle is also being correct, supplied correct, by it. Correct, correct, I correct, haven't correct. seen it till myself practically also. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. do you think uh, yeah is it, so is it going to be reliable if you take that pedal based on that and not because the submental artery was not there yeah you know what uh, there is something called reverse flow submental artery flap okay reverse flow so uh, if you yes, have something like that if you have a situation like that so remember i said just before the submental uh, you know uh, the facial artery and it gives out the submental artery uh, do you remember that uh, picture sorry i think it's too much behind so uh, that picture the submental artery just below the lower border of mandible uh, branching out from the facial artery all right yes, so yeah yes, so what i said was uh, so, uh, ligate the facial artery above the um, uh, branching out of the face of the submental artery so you have a, a a regular flow to the you know from the facial artery upwards into the flap now when you have a situation like this what you can do is you can ligate the facial artery at a lower level and have a reverse flow uh, reverse flow uh, submental uh, uh, flap that is a uh, that is described i haven't done it but uh, that is described for a situation that uh, whoever is asked for the problem there is the venous congestion because of the venous valves no uh, the facial vein uh, it can uh, cause a venous congestion but still they say that uh, it's got a good uh, because this is not a this is a, this is a an aberration from normal so normally it does not happen if it when you are dissecting and you find that there is no submental branch and there is a lingual what you can do is you can ligate the facial artery below and uh, let the let it be a reverse flow submental flap have so, i 
Am yes, I? Yes, this is no? the only thing you are trying to tell. There is more chance of venous congestion in there, but yes. eventually it settles down because it's it a local. It settles down. Exactly. 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 Okay. Okay. Done, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, shall we go ahead, Dr. Shanoi, Dr. Abilasha? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Please, sure, ma'am. Please, please. Yeah. So, latissimus dorsi flap. Okay. So, latissimus dorsi flap is a flap on the side, right? So. Uh, Uh, here you have, as I said, uh, you know, trapezius comes from the. It's in the back from this external occipital protuberance to the twelfth uh, uh, thoracic vertebra. Now, in latissimus dorsi, it is from the the origin is from the fascia of the T7 to the T12 and from lumbar to sacral uh, vertebrae. Right, and also the posterior iliac crest. That is why the latissimus dorsi flap sometimes is combined with a. Uh, combined with a groin flap, that's called a conjoint flap. Many, uh, I mean, I've never done something like this. But uh, what I'm saying is, you all can think of all this when you all are thinking of reconstruction of huge defects, where uh, uh, you can you can use a latissimus dorsi with a, a groin flap or iliac crest uh, flap, right? And uh, uh, the blood supply to the latissimus dorsi is from the circumflex uh, subscapular uh, artery and the thoracodorsal uh, artery. So that's the latissimus dorsi, the red one that you see is a latissimus, just just below the teres major, right? That is that is the bulk of flap, like just like your pectoralis major, which is on the on the uh, front of the chest. This is on the back and the side, right? And the flap that you see on the right side is called the chimeric flap, where you have two flaps from that. Uh, you can you can take two separate flaps, which are uh, you know based on the same mother vessel, that is the thora thoracodorsal uh, artery. Okay, so in every flap, when you're giving an incision, you should know how the vessel pedicle is coming, and then you give your incision. When you're giving your incision, the 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 basic principles are the same: skin, subcutaneous tissue, fascia, and then you identify the muscle, and then you know you what you saw in the pec major, right? And you go down to the muscle, and you always keep. Keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep visualizing where your pedicle is coming, and you keep raising the flap so that you see the pedicle, and therefore do not injure your uh, pedicle. So uh, that is important. Where is the pedicle? So you know where the axillary artery is. Where is the branch, the circumflex uh, branch, and the thoracodorsal uh, artery coming, and uh, therefore you do not injure the pedicle. That is very important. So this is a very reliable flap with a good arc of uh, uh, rotation, but it can be fragile and it can be very uh, bulky, and uh, the donor site may require a split thickness skin graft. So this is not my case. This is thanks to Dr. Sendil Murugan. So you can see that you know your uh, the arm is sort of extended a little bit, and that is the uh, the first picture that you see is the design of the. Uh, Um, uh, the flap, the latissimus dorsi, and that's the muscle paddle that is there, and it has been used to uh, uh, reconstruct the uh, lateral facial defect near the preauricular region, and that again is tubed there. You can see that that is tubed there, right? And the primary site has been uh, has been uh, sutured. <clears throat> So that is your latissimus dorsi flap. The problem here, compared to a pectoralis major, the problem here is the positioning. Or sometimes you may need to, if you want a larger flap, you may need to position the patient in a lateral uh, position, right? <clears throat> so next is the fam flap, the facial artery musculo mucosal flap. So here, what I want you to know to uh, concentrate on is the the left side. Uh, Diagram shows you an axial view of the cheek, <clears throat> and there you can see, you can see the orbicularis oris. You can see the uh, buccinator muscle, <coughs> and you can see the facial artery there, and you can see the facial vein behind. And that's the buccinator muscle. So when you're giving your incision, your incision is through in the fam flap. Through the mucosa, the buccinator muscle, and along with the facial artery. So just below, before, just in front of the Stenson's duct. When you look at it here, you, this is the coronal view. You have the mucosa, the buccinator muscle, and the facial artery. So ligate the facial artery from uh, superior and raise that flap. Ma'am, have water and come, ma'am. We'll wait uh, for no, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. you can have. We'll wait for a minute. Yeah, I'll have. I'll have. 
so that's the fam flap so you have an in, just like your nasolabial flap you have an inferior fam flap and a superior fam flap so the inferior fla fam flap is used for inferior oral de cavity defects like the rmt the inferior alve alveolar ridge the inferior lip the mobile tongue the floor of the mouth well the superior fam flap obviously is for superior defects of the hard palate and the upper lip so now here when you see the fam flap actually this is a beautiful flap that can that we can raise you know uh, what we need to understand here is the course of the facial artery all right so in this picture what you see as number 1 if you can uh, if you can see the number 1 this is the stenson's duct all right this flap is raised around 0.5 to 1 cm from the commissure you give the anti this is the inferiorly based uh, fam flap you give an incision anterior incision from the gingival buccal sulcus upwards to the uh, you know where, how much of a length you want right up to the upper gingival bu buccal sulcus and you take the posterior incision anterior to the stenson's duct so you have a tongue kind of a tongue flap and what does it and what does this fla uh, flap consist of it consists of the it consists of the uh, mucosa it consists of the buccal uh, buccinator muscle and it consists of the facial artery so you when you are when you are raising the flap no you give the anterior incision there you give this anterior incision there and uh, you raise that flap and you keep visualizing the mu buccinator muscle and see the artery the artery is quite thick around 1.5 mm in uh, in width so you can see the artery and then you come up to the superior end of your flap and uh, when you come to the superior end you ligate the facial artery and then do your posterior cut and uh, uh you know you bring you bring that tongue shaped flap down and then this flap can be raised and used to line the uh, inferior defects so that is a flap where if you take if you want a superiorly based you can take an incision you can the base can be here if it is an inferiorly based the base can be lower so it's only a tongue shaped flap so it's such an easy flap in the sense you have only mucosa buccinator muscle and the facial artery so when you're giving that anterior incision what you need to do is you're giving this incision right you're giving somebody has to hold that lip well stretch it out nicely for you you're giving that incision and then you have to lift it up with an alleys or with a adsense and identify the buccinator muscle and then as you're dissecting it in you will you will have to see the facial artery trace the facial artery upwards ligate it up if it is a inferiorly based flap ligate it down if it is a superiorly based flap and that flap that you see on the right this is not my flap this is taken from a textbook ruiz fernandez and that is a flap that is that can be used beautifully for your lining of the superior defects so the advantages of a fam flap is no external scar good access of rot rotation very thin and pliable easy to harvest and it's it's a flap that is not being used very much by us because of our, uh i think we should try to do it there's a, modi a modification of the fam flap where they use the fam flap along with a masseter fascia where you may have to give an incision in the uh, submandible an external incision that's a modification that has been described you can take uh um, you know up to uh, widths of 3 3 cm where you can even do a primary closure of the uh donor site drawback is the limited width 3 cm may not be much uh so and also the need to use a block because you can bite as you said with the nasolabial flap no it can uh, be traumatized now coming so that with that we finish off with the most of the flaps i have missed out on a few but i think those are very easy for you so uh with this we come to the end of the flaps and now coming to monitoring of the flaps the only two things that can happen with any flap is arterial compromise and venous compromise how do you know whether it's an arterial or venous arterial if it's pale the capillary refill is not uh, not fast you know you, sh you should be getting it within uh two seconds if it is not happening then there there's a slow capillary refill if it's cool to touch uh, then then it's an arterial uh, you know if there's no pulse so not all flaps will need will have a pulse but 
if you don't have a pulse then that looks like an arterial compromise venous compromise it will be botchy swollen bluish um, you know that kind of a grayish or a kind of a uh, say, or the skin if you have grafted over the flap in you know, a muscle flap then there's no take of the graft all these are indications that the flap is not taking properly and as a resident if your consultant has done a flap what all are do you need to do you know in your post operative you make a chart and what is it that you, so the flap parameters that you have to take care of te is temperature temperature it should be warm that is what is a desirable um, a parameter for the flap thank you uh, the color pink is ideal you wouldn't want a dusky red you wouldn't want a bluish a pink is ideal capillary refill 2 to 3 seconds how do you see the you know you have your nail bed you just press and leave that's called capillary refill same thing with the flap when you press and leave it should if it is of the mucosa if it is a fair person uh, of the skin you will be able to see that texture a soft is ideal if you have swollen and soft and boggy then uh, that is not the texture that you want skin changes it should resemble the skin of the donor site if it is uh, looking blistered looking uh, you know blue or dark or uh um uh, dusk you know um grayish in color then that's not what you want edema and swelling should not be more than what is expected of a post operative swelling pulse not all flaps as i said earlier will have a pulse but you could think of a pulse you could do a doppler pressure on the pedicle is not desirable patient parameters what do you want pulse should be 60 to 100 meet, uh, beats per minute blood pressure more than 90 by 60 less than 140 by 100 respiratory rate 16 to 20 per minute oxygen saturation more than 95 percent urine output 0.5 ml per kg per hour at least more than that uh, drain should be ideally clear or pinkish you don't want blood uh, tinged or bloody drain that is not what you want uh, pain ideally it should be pain free if there is some post operative pain it should be manageable with analgesics but if it's more than that then there's something wrong there so these are the parameters that you would be uh, looking looking out for in your immediate post operative care when you are doing your residency so uh, uh, to just summarize nasal labial, labial, labial flaps good for you know upper commissure floor of the mouth or antral fistula submental flap or antral fistula, fistula or even the lower uh, defects forehead flap for tongue for uh, cheek defects temporalis flap for the orbit cheek uh, intraoral defects buccal fat pad which i did not speak about in oral antral fistula uh, it closure it's very good uh, platysma flap for the lower face and neck trapezius flap uh, is very good for the scalp Sternocleidomastoid, which I have not spoken about, can be used for the neck and even for the uh, lower uh, uh, mandible, uh, lower face region. Pectoralis, PMMC, and latissimus dorsi, very good flaps for uh, uh, reconstruction of the cheek and uh, 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 closure of the neck, the, uh, the vessels. The uh, delta pectoral flap, also uh, a very good flap for the areas that I have shown you on the diagram. So this is an article in 2019 where free versus pedicle flaps uh, for reconstruction. It's a systematic review where a total of 30 articles were included. And they have seen that when they compared in these articles, the comparison of free flap and uh, uh, pedicle flap, they found that uh, the you know, a free flap is... Uh, uh, takes longer operative time, it is higher cost, higher incidence of post-operative revisions uh, compared to pedicle flap. But uh, And a free flap is also associated with longer stay in the inter intensive care unit, which means that uh, it's more expensive uh, than a supraclavicular artery island flap or a submental island flap. They are These two flaps, are, what is a supraclavicular artery island flap? It's basically the same as the, uh, you know, the uh, trapezius flap. It you, uh, the, the scapular system, the paraspinous uh, portion of the scapular venous system is being used. So the, the flap over the clavicle and the uh, deltoid region. Uh, so these flaps are supposed to be superior. Uh, so according to the system, systematic review, even now submental island flap and uh, supraclavicular artery uh, island flap are comparably favorable, uh, comparable to uh, free flap uh, in specific indications. That's what they say. So uh, we cannot write off uh, 
uh, regional flaps uh, just because microvascular has come in. And if you work in an institution like mine where we even regional flaps, I find general surgeons and ENT surgeons, or there are many uh, people who still do not even know to do a PMMC flap. I must say that, uh, you know, I, I'm one of, uh, one of the maxillofacial surgeons in Salem is a small place, I guess, but people uh, look up to uh, a maxillofacial surgeon and say, wow, teach me to do a PMMC flap. So if we have reached that, I think each one of you can, if I can do it, I'm telling you any one of you can do it. Yeah. So my references, I would expect, I mean, I would um, encourage the young ones to read Stellan Marin. Ilan Cohen's is uh, Ethanandan's book on local flaps is good. Uh, there's a very good book by Way and Mardini. Rui Fernandez, I found, was the best book for local and regional flaps and head and neck reconstruction. So my final thoughts are be thoughtful. Consider all the options from simple. Go from simple to complex. And please have a knowledge on the vascular anatomy and the, uh, the uh, because, you know, flaps is like you're developing your soft tissue skills. And it's very easy. I think it's much easier to do a bone uh, surgery. I think Shubra will be able to tell better than a soft tissue. Handling soft tissue is like an art, you know, and that you should develop. And uh, always be prepared for failure. Don't think that you know, I I never had. I had so many failures. I've uh, I've uh, got frustrated. It's all part of this uh, yeah, process of uh, becoming uh, better. And every day you learn from your failures. That's the way forward. And uh, you know, it's always nice to be congratulated when your work is not noticed. But unfortunately, all my work is noticed because that's the kind of um, uh, you know reconstruction with regional flaps. You cannot have um, you know. Uh, uh, hidden uh, scars and they are very obvious because uh, uh, it's not replacing like with like. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, 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 it is a compromise solution, but it is a solution after all. Thank you so much. And so uh, before I close, uh, I'm just wondering whether you have an option for reconstruction in this case. If you have, please put it on your chat box. Dr. Shubra will uh, uh, tell me and because I have to operate on this case. And I'm looking out for solutions from y'all. Dr. Shubra, any solutions from anyone, please? <laughs> I've been thinking about it, ma'am. We will discuss it. But yeah, it's open to everybody over here. Anybody I'm who sure. can give us an easier option. Yeah, please don't uh, give me uh, please don't give me microvascular options. Huh? I'm uh, not working in them. the option of a pre fibula. Uh, ah, I knew that. That, <laughs> that that's that's only there in the line. Something else other than that. Yeah, because I, I am not, uh, I cannot do a free fibula. I don't have Shubra coming over. She says it's, it's a uh, uh, lockdown, madam. I can't be there. Otherwise, she comes to help me with a lot of cases. And I'm hoping to work with her in future too. Uh, but here I have to resect and I have to reconstruct. So uh, give me an option that's easy, you know. Mom, in between, there's a doubt on, a P like, since we all know PMMC is the workhorse for head and neck reconstruction. And it is one of the best robust flap which we are dealing with. But we do get also failures with PMMC. So there's a question on that. Uh, like what happens when, when there is a problem with a PMMC? What local option or a regional option do you consider that time? Correct. Good. So, um, you know, uh, if you look into literature, the, the failure with PMMC is uh, less than 5%, right? Uh, if you have a failure with PMMC, it is because you have handled the pedicle badly or you have sheared the, uh, even if you shear the perforators, uh, you may have uh, the skin flap going, but the muscle may not, muscle may still remain and you can just do a skin graft. But despite all that, what I'm saying is if you have a flap failure, uh, then you need to think of another flap, either regional flap. Uh, so you have options like that, again, depends on the size of the defect. So you have options like your trapezius flap, your latissimus dorsi. Uh, if you can manage with the temporalis, good enough. So depending on the size of the defect, you would choose any of these other flaps that you have. Because if you have taken a PMMC flap, I'm sure it's a large defect. It's not something that can be, it can't be with it. So I guess you would have to think of a latissimus dorsi, which is similar to a PMMC. You know, uh, what I have realized from my experience is, you know, territory is what is all in the mind. You know, when I operate and now look at this one, uh, I have to go to the base of the skull and I'm really worried yeah, I'm worried because that's not my my regular uh, path, right? If I go posterior to the posterior pharyngeal uh, 
you know when i'm doing a resection posterior pharyngeal wall when i reach that fascial pillar my i'm i'm not very sure despite so many years of what i'm saying you know so the same thing is with pmmc i i was scared of the pmmc till i was told that yes you can do and went ahead so i have a feeling that you can do if you can do a pmmc you can do a latissimus dorsi a trapezius maybe may need a lot more of uh, you know uh, uh, a practice and uh, a uh, uh, learning curve may be higher but a pmmc if it fails you can go for a latissimus dorsi yeah or maybe there is a partial good backup you can say ld is a good backup for pmmc yeah 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 yeah
so here we come to a end of a fantastic session thank you so much ma'am for being with us and for such lovely and wonderful cases you have shown this is our cims webinar team Thank so you. today's session was i am 100% sure that the participant must have been benefited because still we have so many participants who are uh, waiting so that we can wind up the session they are still waiting <laughs> upcoming webinars this is an important topic from point of view of post graduates for uh, practicals as well as theory exams this will be on plates and screws in oral and maxillofacial surgery by none other than dr ramakrishna shinoy this will be on 14th of august 11 am and it will be live telecast on facebook then on 18th again 11 am we have uh, one more webinar which will be by dr anand narayan it will be on guided surgery in or by to patient trauma this is regarding the qr code for cims youtube channel you can scan it you can subscribe and please don't forget to hit the bell icon so that whatever videos are uploaded you will get a notification regarding that and please don't forget to like and follow us on facebook as well thank you from my side thank you shubhra thank you dr reena ma'am for accepting our invitation and for for, for being with us today thank you so much thank you thank you abhilasha thank you thanks a lot i have a i have a very uh, important task to do uh there is a small token of appreciation uh, from our side so as we all know uh, dr reena just uh, i mean it was a fantastic session that we had um i mean i felt that i should be here actually uh, the way it went on yeah and uh, i was fascinated by it and very well moderated by shubha so i mean it's amazing uh, how you ladies are doing such fantastic things uh, thank you dr reena there's a small certificate uh, thank you uh, so from much from our side thank you uh, kindly do accept it Thank and you. i will be uh, sending it through mail of course thank and you. shubhra thank you so much thank uh, you thank you so yeah. much that looks more beautiful and, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you and thank, thank you, you audience uh, for being with us always so see you on 14th where you may have to uh, bear with me <laughs> we are waiting yeah, sir looking there. forward waiting so, yeah <laughs> i know thank you so somehow i am getting a chance to speak at the back yeah. end of the session <laughs> so, thank you so much thank and, you and uh, stay safe stay happy and uh, keep doing surgeries so that our fraternity uh, grows by leaps and bounds thank you so much thank you